Thank you all very much for joining us this morning. Uh, my name is Steve McMenamin. I like this event, which is part of the ongoing series of the Greenwich Roundtable. Our topic this morning, energy and infrastructure, investing with the new administration, is a continuation of Ryan's examination on the risks and opportunities that lie in this area. Uh, a few months ago, we heard from the experts on planes, trains, and ships. Uh, today, our speakers are the best in their class, and I'll briefly introduce them after I say this. Uh, the speakers' views are are their own and don't necessarily reflect the views of the Greenwich Roundtable Board or its staff and its members. Uh, Philip Deutsch is the founder of NGP, uh, Energy Technology Partners, a private equity manager focused on renewables. Before that, Phil led the renewable energy investments at Perseus LLC, where he was one of the earliest private equity investors in renewable energy, power distributed generation, energy management and control, and power electronics. Uh, Phil sits on many boards in the field. He's a sought-after speaker and a respected writer for the Renewable Energy Trade Press. Uh, sitting to Phil's left, John Steinbaugh is a managing partner with Brookfield Asset Management and chief financial officer of Brookfield's infrastructure group. With $80 billion of AUM, Brookfield seems to be a force of nature in the infrastructure market. Uh, before that, John was an M&A specialist in the en energy group of Credit Suisse. Uh, since he's worked on over 15 billion, since then he's worked on over 15 billion in energy and infrastructure deals. Sitting to John's left, Frank Potow is a managing member of the investment committee of Green Hill Capital Partners. Green Hill has rose to become one of the most respected merchant banking firms in modern times. Uh, Frank has more than 20 years of invest experience investing in private equity of energy companies. For that, he was a founding partner of Societe Generale Capital Partners, a managing director of Thayer Capital Partners, and a principal at Odyssey Partners. Uh, and sitting to my left, the moderator of the Greenwich Roundtable today is Ryan Dartnell. Although Ryan needs no introduction, I will say that he's led um, most of the GR sessions that were pound for pound our best money makers. Ryan, it's all yours. We'll try and live up to that today. Thank you. I'm looking forward to this. We had dinner last night. It was uh, a lively conversation, and I'll leave it at that. It, in most discussions on energy, knowledgeable experts will agree on at least one thing, and that's that when you talk about solar, wind, uh, the fossil fuels, uh, any of the energy sources, they, say, they basically will quickly say all of the above. Given the long-term energy needs of the country and of the planet, um, everybody agrees that we just have to increase uh, input into the pie. Um, I thought I'd just quickly review our power usage in the United States, uh, and then I'd uh, end with a quote from Barack Obama and pass over to our, our experts. In the U.S., 49% 49% of our electricity is generated from coal. 20% uh, comes from natural gas. About 19% comes from nuclear power. And that leaves about nine, nine and a half percent in renewables today. The Energy Information Administration, which is part of the Department of Energy, projects in 2030, so 21 years from today, that basically fossil fuels, coal plus natural gas, will still be 67 percent. So today it's around 70 percent. It'll be 67 percent. Natural gas will stay, I'm sorry, nuclear will shrink a little bit to about 17 and a half percent. Renewables are going to grow from 9.5%, according to them, to, say, 14%. We need to bear in mind that the pie is, is growing, however. By 2030, they're talking about, in 2007 dollars, the pie growing by about 50%. So the 14% that we're going to have in renewables will be on a much larger, uh, in a larger pie, so larger market share in a larger pie. So we, even though 14% in 2030 doesn't sound like very much, the rate of growth is, is tremendous. Uh, consider the case of wind. We talked about it last night. Basically, the installed capacity in power last year, over 35%, maybe 45% was, was wind power. So there's a lot going on. Wind constitutes about 1% to 2% of our energy power in the United States. Uh, today. In Texas, it's about 4%, and they're taking it very seriously. There are a lot of investments in transmission, and they're trying to, to, to grow the wind farms in Texas. Um, I thought, it, as I was doing a little bit of research, I, I was curious about 
the United States' energy usage, how much do we use for our power and how much do we use for our transport? And I was surprised by the figure. I'd be curious just to do a, a quick poll of the audience. For power side, if, so for heavy industry, for manufacturing, for lighting your house, for lighting commercial buildings, is that greater than 50% of our total usage or, or is it greater than 50%? Show of hands. Three hands. <laughs> okay. You'll notice Pato didn't answer the question. <laughs> So basically, I, I won't go through the, uh, the further poll since I only got three hands, but I was, I was surprised to see that transportation is 46% of our usage in the United States. And when I, we did a little bit of further research, it was, I guess we shouldn't be surprised because the United States has a, a lot of cars everybody likes to drive. Out, for every 1,000 people in the United States, there's 765 <coughs> automobiles. Contrast that to, say, a country like Poland, which is about 350. And then China, uh, as we all have been, begun to hear, is 10 cars per 1,000 people. So an extraordinary number of cars coming up in the future. Um, basically, the last thing I want to do is uh, read a quote from the Department of Energy website, which is President Obama speaking in March of this year. He says, so we have a choice to make. We can remain one of the world's leading importers of foreign oil, or we can make the investments that would allow us to become one of the leading exporters of renewable energy. We can let climate change continue to go unchecked, or we can help stop it. We can let the jobs of tomorrow be created abroad, or we can create those jobs right here in America and lay the foundation for lasting prosperity. So with that, I'm going to hand over to the panelists. I see Frank at the end. I'm... Uh, it's always tough to go last, even though he volunteered. Frank, uh, rather than starting with Phil, just two minutes on your view of what's going on in the natural gas sector in the United States with the deep shale plays, if you would. Just two minutes, and then we're, we'll start with Phil. Um, natural gas is an important um, generator of power in the United States. Um, it's also important because it's a largely domestic resource. Um, well over 95% of the gas consumed in North America is generated in North America, and that's uh, obviously very different from oil, uh, which is increasingly imported from foreign sources. Um, one of the big changes in the natural gas market, and really it's the most significant change, I think, in the last uh, 30 years, has been the... Um, emergence of gas supply, domestic natural gas supply, largely in the United States, but also increasingly in Canada, uh, from unconventional sources, primarily gas shales. And so um, last year, the United States got roughly 10% of its natural gas from um, these uh, gas shales, which are much, much tighter uh, and, uh, you know, uh, denser rock than the sandstone that gas normally comes from. But that 10% is an increase from uh, less than 2% just five or six years ago. And so we've seen really a, a, about a 400% increase in the supply of gas from shales over the last six years. And to put it in perspective, uh, that is about, um, and by the way, most of that increase, 80% of it's been just in the last two years. And the increase in supply of gas shales has been about five times the growth in demand. And as a result, we've really seen the impact in the price of natural gas, which is not isolated from the price of oil. It's certainly impacted by the price of oil. But whereas oil fell from a high of 140 to a low of roughly $35 and has now recovered to over $60, uh, gas fell from a high of $14 uh, an MMBTU, which is roughly 1,000 cubic feet or an MCF, uh, to a low of about $3.30 and really hasn't recovered. And so I think... Uh, what we're seeing now is the emergence of these gas shales, which many people think uh, might be a very long-term, up to a 100-year supply of largely domestic-produced natural gas. And to the extent it's not domestically produced, it's coming from Canada, which is a born and bred Canadian, I would say, is a pretty reliable and stable, friendly source. So uh, that's just one sort of uh, insight as to what's going on with natural gas. Thanks. Okay. Frank, looking at the Department of Energy website, it, there's a lot of action, a lot of people talking about the alternatives, and it does look like the scientists are running the asylum down there. What's your view from Washington on the clean technology side? For me? Or for, 
Uh, uh, exactly. Um, the, the only reason we trust Canada, Frank, is because it's two tank days from the United States, uh, by the way. Uh, the, uh, Washington is a, uh, is a very easy place to predict because uh, if you look at the incentive structure and the duration of uh, administrations, you always can say if you predict the easy course, spend the most money, avoid tough decisions, that's how Washington goes. So um, the budget of the Department of Energy, for example, this last year, let's say, was $14 billion. I'm, I'm off of my numbers, but not too much. And of that, $10 billion was for nuclear weapons. The DOE is the uh, steward of the nuclear weapon program for the Department of Defense. So about out of $14 billion, $4 billion was discretionary. This year, the department will be asked to spend $140 billion, um, and they have no one really confirmed for any positions. So when you look at it and you say, what's going to happen this year in Washington, on the margin, probably what happened last year. Um, so in that sense, I think that the administration is deeply committed, and we can get into this in a second, and there are, there's a Nobel Prize winner who's a, obviously a very smart guy running uh, the agency, but it's a bureaucracy, and uh, that bureaucracy is pretty tough. So I don't think that anyone should expect radical changes. I think the first question that you're going to see everyone will be on the thinks margin. about when they hear and about is alternative energy or, or the new energy technologies so uh, is that's how I'd say it. I, can you make money doing it? Is this just a social fad cocktail you party show? Two can one really make money? It'll definitely be different. And in you know, I would just throw out a few uh, examples uh, to answer that we'll question. Uh, many so of you may what, know that John Walton, uh, now deceased, but the heir to the Walmart today. fortune, sure. invested two hundred fifty million dollars in First okay. Solar the and the uh, ended up making two to three billion dollars on that. A fund on the West Coast, you may have heard of GFI, acquired a company called GT Solar for less than ninety million dollars. Two years later took out $500 million cash at the IPO. The company had tremendous backlog. Um, Evergreen Solar, an investment we were lucky to be involved in, started out as a $10 million market cap company, went to half a billion. The richest man in China, you may have heard this phrase, founded SunTech. He's, of course, an Australian citizen and not the richest person in China, but it's a good tagline. And, and there are 150 people at Goldman Sachs, at each of which will tell you they're the ones that did Zilka and Horizon Wind. Uh, because it was so successful. Uh, Warren Buffett, GE, Florida Power and Light, Applied Materials, every one of these companies has looked at this sector and said it's a way to make money, albeit with their own uh, justifications and approaches. Um, if you look at companies such as Vestas or Suzlon or SunTech, for Solar, QCells, REC, SunPower, these are multi-billion dollar cash flow companies. So I don't think there's any doubt that people have made money in the sector. The real question is, can you make money in the sector? Do you have an approach? Do you have the discipline? Do you have the experience to make money? And if you look at today's journal, I think any of us would say that the activities one sees in energy technology, the volatility, the innovation, smart people can make money in the sector. But you've got to have, as in any other sector, a theory of investing, a strategy, and, and as you'll hear me repeat, I think a discipline to it. So I think the answer is absolutely you can make money in it, and the question is, do you know how to do that? Um, and the second uh, point that you know, I think is worth talking about is in this administration issue. Um, the, the short answer, and we got to this a little bit earlier, one cannot bribe this administration to do more for energy technology. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. If you said to me, you know, Phil, what's your wildest dream that you'd have the President of the United States say, he's exceeded by 10x. I mean, it's just <laughs> unbelievable. Um, there's $47 billion for renewables. There's $20 billion of tax incentives. They've changed the tax incentives so that you can actually go to the Treasury Department and get a refund on the WIND program. Uh, there's $100 billion of loan guarantees. Uh, Solyndria, uh, basically a barely re uh, revenue-producing company, just got a half a billion dollar loan guarantee. Uh, the Secretary of Interior is fighting with the head of the EPA, fighting with Carol Brown or fighting with the DOE to see who's going to take the lead on all things energy. Uh, 
Waxman says we're going to have a cap and trade bill this week. Uh, we've seen new CAFE standards. We've seen EPA go after greenhouse gases. It is stunning how complete the administration's commitment is to change on this topic. Um, and then for my little quiz, which I think I, it's going to be easier for people to answer, how many people here have been to Newton, Iowa? Well, I've been to Newton, Iowa, and, you, and I will tell you, there will not be a president of the United States in the next 20 years that doesn't go to Newton, Iowa. And every candidate has already been there, basically, and Barack Obama just went there because Newton, Iowa is where Maytag used to be. They left Newton, Iowa, and in its place, there's now a biodiesel plant, two wind farms, and a host of energy technology companies. Every presidential candidate spends a lot of time in Iowa, and they're all going to spend time in Newton because they love it as a poster child of what the future can be. No more Maytag plant, but you get a wind blade plant. And so I just want to give you a sense of how feverish uh, and permanent this shift is uh, in Washington, D.C. Now, at the same time, one has to be careful about how broad that shift's going to be. I think in wind and solar, for sure you're going to see that for years to come. Uh, on the margin, you'll see things like metering and electric vehicles. There'll be money in programs. The deep issues such as cap and trade or transmission, I think you have to be more pessimistic. The hard problems where you really have to uh, break some eggs are not going to be so easy. So maybe you'll get a cap and trade bill that says 15 years from now we'll do something serious. But on the heavy lifting, as I alluded to earlier, I don't think that's going to be a very easy change, notwithstanding the feverish pitch on alternative energy. And that gets into the last thing I want to talk about very quickly, which is the risks of the sector. It is a risk to make an investment based on a political outcome. We wouldn't risk a dollar of our own money or our fund's money trying to bet which way any administration is going to go. There's a risk in energy technology of adoption. Utilities and incumbent oil and gas companies are not dumb. It's not like they, there's some great idea that they just missed and two scientists in Palo Alto thought of, backed <laughs> by some VC fund. There's risk of capital intensity. How long does it take? And so when one thinks about all those risks, this gets back to the approach. We think after 10 years in the space, the right way to attack it is invest in companies with commercial revenues um, and take advantage of some of the drivers that are in the papers that are, that are interesting, technological innovation, concerns about climate change, concerns about energy independence, concerns about energy supply and demand, more information management. So uh, I don't want to turn this into a pitch, uh, and I know how boring those are, but I just say you should look at, I think, energy technology saying, yes, you can make money. Yes, the government's actually on your side. There are risks but in a smart, disciplined strategy, you can actually mitigate those risks and really try and make as much money as, as some of the examples I gave earlier. So that's a kind of an approach to new energy technologies. Phil, thank you. You didn't mention ethanol. Uh, that was the buzzword last year and the year before. What, what's, what are the, uh, what's the news on ethanol? Uh, e ethanol, we, we don't talk about ethanol in energy technology in Washington, D.C. because it's... Uh, <laughs> uh, we don't... Very mean... Ethanol, I think, is a, uh, a very interesting issue. Um, I think on the, at a very uh, macro level, what you see with ethanol is any time you take one market, let's say corn, and you correlate it to an, a market, energy market, the energy market swamps it. So it's immediately a, an ethanol plant right, really just creates, makes corn into a transportation fuel. Once that works the energy market swamps the input and drives up the price of corn. The same occurs in solar power. When solar power becomes popular, the price of silicon goes up. In wind, as soon as wind became popular, gearboxes, balsa wood goes up in price. For biodiesel, soy goes up in price. So the energy markets are so big, they swamp it. And I think that's one thing about ethanol. The second problem, the second takeaway from ethanol is how bad the government is. As you say, year and a half ago, two years ago, the biggest program for the government for energy technology was corn-based ethanol. Today, you can't touch that with a 30-foot pole, but for the fact that the farmers have, you know, 800 electoral delegates 
it would be dead man walking in D.C. No one talks about it. And, it go, and I think that's the part of political risk, which is that support went away like that, and now everyone's talking about cellulosic next generation. Who knows what that means? But it really is clear that on the uh, ethanol side, it, it's not a good poster child for government support. Okay, thanks. Brookfield got into the renewable business uh, probably about eight years ago, and for different reasons than uh, we've talked about thus far. We've historically been an investor in hard assets, uh, assets that uh, are long-lived, have stable cash flow, and generally will uh, yield inflationary gains in terms of revenues. And when we first got in, we focused on hydroelectric. And the reason why we did that was that, first of all, hydro plants have no fuel costs. And power prices in the United States are generally driven by natural gas prices, so very high margin investments. And uh, over time, despite uh, the point that Frank was making, we think that natural gas prices are going to rise and you'll have increasing asset value. So very good long-term assets to invest in. And as we look to build our business, we have gotten into the wind business. And the wind business, one of the things that Ryan was mentioning to begin with is that uh, renewables are 9.5% of the resource mix in the United States. That's actually a bit misleading because... If you back out the hydro plants that have been around for 100 years, the number is really about 1%. So wind is a very nascent industry in the United States. And, but the flip side is if you look at, over the last couple of years, the amount of uh, generation that has come online, wind has accounted for, in 2007, roughly 35% of generation additions, and in 2008, close to 50%. So it is a very high growth area. And the United States, uh, I'm not sure if it has crossed over, but uh, will soon, if it has not already become, the largest wind-producing country in the world. Um, there has been a number of uh, public policies that have encouraged it. It's uh, predominantly been tax credits. There's a very attractive production tax credit that uh, is uh, $20 per megawatt hour for a 10-year period of time on uh, each megawatt hour produced by a wind plant, so a very powerful tax incentive. That combined with, if you look in the United States, uh, close to half of the states in the United States have adopted uh, renewable portfolio standards. So as we were talking about uh, whether President Obama will put in place a national RPS, well, a national RPS uh, will have an impact, but to a certain degree, a lot of the legwork has already been done because the states have put in place programs and in a number of instances, these uh, programs are more <coughs> stringent or rigorous than what the federal government uh, is proposing. So that has really led to the growth in the industry up to this point. But there is no doubt that with the current administration, there are a number of additional benefits that are being put in place. Uh, probably one of the biggest ones is the Obama administration has extended the production tax credit for three years. It used to be on a one-year cycle, and because of that, the investment in the United States was always very lumpy, where people were trying to get their projects online before the expiration of the PTC. <coughs> so with three years, there's more stability in the investment cycle, which is encouraging more people to deploy capital, manufacturers to have a little bit more visibility in terms of what the backlog is going to look like going forward, et cetera. So a, a favorable dynamic. And, and Phil mentioned right now, one of the big factors in the industry has been uh, capital, particularly on the tax equity side, with the banks and the insurance companies who have been the biggest players in that market uh, and uh, not really uh, with uh, tax appetite. The program where you can have a 30% investment tax credit up front and convert it into cash day one is going to provide a very powerful incentive over the next couple of years to build renewable energy projects. So we, we see that this is going to be something that uh, is going to continue its growth trajectory. And uh, wind right now is the most economic of uh, renewable power sources. If you take a look at it, it's got a production cost, and it depends very much on the location that you're looking at, but probably $100 to $110 per megawatt hour. So still significantly above a natural gas plant, as an example and still requiring the incentives, the production tax credit, and the renewable portfolio standards in order to encourage people to, to build. But nonetheless, uh, the gap has uh, closed considerably, whereas if you look back probably five or ten years ago, 
that was, uh, I don't know the exact number, but it was probably in excess of $200 a megawatt hour. So wind has come down the cost curve uh, considerably. Uh, another thing that we are interested in, and, and this is uh, a bit of a counterpoint to what Phil was talking about, is we think there's going to be a considerable opportunity to invest in the transmission grid. Because if you think about where wind resource is, the best wind resource and locations for utility-scale wind farms are in the middle of the country, predominantly. So if you look from Texas up through the Dakotas, that whole region is where most of the wind farms in the United States are being built. And that's not where the population is. So the way that the transmission grid in the United States was constructed was generally on a patchwork basis, and it was very localized. You had utility companies that had uh, power plants that were pretty close to their load, and that's what the grid was designed to do. Now the grid is being asked to transmit power over much longer distances to bring this renewable power to market. So it's going to require substantial expansions and upgrades in order to enable the renewable power to get to market. Now, I agree with Phil that uh, permitting is clearly an issue, and another thing is that uh, the transmission side of things is uh, a combination of federal regulation and state, and the state is particularly important on the permitting and siting side of things. And I agree that it's going to be very difficult when you start to look at New England, other areas where siting is virtually impossible. But if you look at the middle of the country, it's relatively easy to get uh, projects sited, and there are billions of dollars of projects that are underway right now. So presently, there's a big advantage for incumbent utilities. It's more difficult for independent developers to pursue these projects, but uh, nonetheless, uh, we think that uh, there's going to be substantial capital invested, and uh, one of the wild cards is going to be to what extent can the Obama administration end up uh, solving the state versus federal issue and make it easier to build more longer haul transmission lines that uh, cross states. So in terms of one of the other things I'll just kind of maybe finish on is talk about returns. We're an asset investor, so we don't invest in any of the technology aspect of the business, uh, the manufacturing side, et cetera, or even emerging technologies uh, such as uh, solar and some of the other ones. We're more focused on developed technologies. If I take a look at uh, projects that have been de-risked, so a wind project at financial close, it is an infrastructure-type investment where you get infrastructure-type returns. So in today's market, it's probably a mid-teens return on equity. If you take a look at development where you're taking more risk and uh, there's uh, considerably greater uncertainty as to whether or not you're going to get uh, projects uh, over the finish line and quite a bit of at-risk capital, that's more of a private equity play. And as Phil talked about, there have been a number of people, uh, Goldman Sachs with Horizon, that have made a ton of money by uh, deploying and executing that strategy effectively. And there's a number of other private equity firms who are going down similar paths, but uh, right now the amount of money they earn has uh, been put uh, in question by uh, the recent credit crunch. But nonetheless, uh, we think there's good opportunity to play the risk spectrum where you want to, whether it be the more stable infrastructure side or a private equity side. Great. John, could you make the point on states adopting even higher standards than the governments uh, a little more strongly and give us a bit more color on who are the states that are uh, most progressive in that, that regard? Yeah, and it, it really does vary state by state, but uh, California has been probably one of the most uh, progressive. Uh, their RPS standard, if I recall, is uh, about 25% of their resource mix by 2020. So it is uh, encouraging quite a bit of uh, wind development. If you look at the western part of the United States, wind development is all aimed at uh, serving the California market. So people are developing wind projects in Idaho, Oregon, even further east than that, and trying to transmit that to California to take advantage of the uplift you get and the contracts you can get from the California market. So that, that's one example that's probably the most prominent. Can I? Uh, so there's, so here's, a, here's an interesting real-world Washington problem. Uh, so the renewable portfolio standards mandate a utility produce X percent of its power from a renewable source. And someone says, if I burn uh, wood chips, does that count as a renewable source? 
And the answer usually is yes if it's from waste wood. Of course, then people like Frank say, well, isn't coal kind of like wood chips except a thousand years older? And someone says that that's too smart a question. Shut up. <laughs> and then, then someone says, well, why do we have a renewable portfolio standard? And, and the, the Nobel Prize winner at the DOE says, because we want to fight climate change and we want to have energy independence. And then someone says, well, that's good, so nuclear power counts, right? No carbon, relatively uh, domestic. And the answer to that usually is, hell no, that doesn't count. And now all of a sudden you see where the system has a relatively interesting question in front of it, and that creates logjam, because Washington doesn't like interesting hard questions. And so in the renewable portfolio standard, now they call it the renewable energy standard, even though there's no difference, there are some real tough questions uh, about how this gets played out, because tough questions are hard. And so I think it's a really great point, and it would be very fun to watch it play out and see how they maneuver around some of these uh, uh, potholes. And to maybe add to that point, if you take a look at some of the legislative initiatives, the renewable energy standard, as it's now called, versus uh, carbon regulation, in some respects they're duplicative because uh, carbon regulation is going to encourage renewable energy by putting a premium on the cost of fossil fuel which will raise the price that a renewable energy facility will yield. And another aspect of it that's interesting is that uh, carbon regulation will not discriminate against the nuclear plants. So it really is a question as to which direction the federal government ends up going down, what sort of uh, legislation initiative is passed, which will then impact uh, which uh, generating sources uh, are benefit from it. Okay, so just before we pass on to Frank, I'd be interested in both of your views on smart grid metering efficiency uh, boosts and how how to invest in that area or to invest in that area. Phil? So love just for some of you in the room that might not be familiar with the, the terminology, a stunning number of us have uh, electric meters at, at our homes that are actually read by a human being that comes around in a truck, if you can believe that. And then there's some that have it that are done in an automated fashion one way, so the information goes from your home to the utility. Very few people have two-way communication with their meters. And that's important because there are a number of decisions that go on in your home that you'd probably like to have some knowledge of and control. For example, if you could on a macro scale turn, down, turn up everyone's air conditioning from 68 degrees to 69 uh, during the summer, in aggregate, that's a lot of energy savings and therefore reduction in the peak energy demand. And there are companies called Converge and Enernoc that are public that have thought of an interesting way to do that. To do all that, you need smart meters. You need to be able to control what's going on in your home. And it is the wave of the future. We should price energy as to how much it costs. You should pay more for energy at noon on, on a hot summer day than you do at noon in the winter. The system doesn't do that right now because, once again, not a lot of political will to raise electric rates. But it probably will happen. There probably will be smart meters. And there are some companies, too, I just mentioned, that are on that, as is ITRON and, and others, GE. The danger is, do utilities really care about smart meters? I mean, or do they care about blackouts or making sure they're getting natural gas at a good price or transmission so if a squirrel runs across a substation or a wire in, in a Cleveland, the power doesn't go out in New York City? So when you talk to the head of advanced metering at a utility, they say advanced metering is the future. It's going to happen next year. We love it. You get in at the CEO level, the CEO says, I don't want there to ever be a blackout. Everything else is a problem for another day. So I think it's a very interesting area, but once again, uh, you really have to figure out what the drivers are and what is the time horizon on your investment. And so that's what, I would, what has worried us a little bit about the smart meeting area. And, and I would echo that uh, and maybe be a little more cautious uh, than Phil regarding implementation of it because the technology is out there, the technology works, and to put in place a two-way communication system between the home, the utility, and be able to track real-time energy prices and then link that to devices, uh, all of it makes perfect sense. 
but you have to realize that in order for that to work, it has got to be implemented by the utilities, which is going to be on a state-by-state -state basis. And the utilities have got to have incentives to be able to do it because the way a utility ends up earning money is they get a return on the rate base or their invested capital. So energy is a pass-through. So they're largely indifferent to what happens uh, with respect to energy. There's no incentive for them to save energy, really, although utility commissions have tried to put in place demand-side uh, management, uh, but it's never really worked. So the utility executive has got tremendous pressure right now from a non-discretionary capital standpoint. They've got to invest in transmission. They've got to invest in pollution control equipment. They've got to invest in new generation. And they're strained from a capital budgeting standpoint. So where smart grids end up fit within the pecking order is uh, relatively low in my perspective. And then also to put in place through the utility commissions all the incentives to make it work I think is going to take quite a long time. I think that the alternate energy stuff is incredibly fascinating, and it's very interesting, and I think it's potentially very lucrative. And as Phil pointed out, uh, very rightly so, it has been proven to be lucrative for many people. But, um, you, you know, no business exists in a vacuum, and all the, uh, all the alternate energy businesses um, exist within the larger framework of the global supply and demand for all forms of energy. And I think it's important to sort of put in context what's going on and what the initiatives are and the priorities in Washington, D.C. versus what's the reality of where is 99% of the uh, energy currently supplied from and what are the macro trends affecting those industries. And uh, just to put it in perspective, uh, we were vigorously discussing last night uh, what's happened with ethanol because I think um, – many people can agree that the large push from the previous administration uh, towards renewable energy supply was to encourage the use of ethanol. And I think the number last year was in the order of magnitude 10 billion gallons of ethanol uh, consumed in the United States, and I may be off by a couple billion. But, but to put that number in perspective, and, and, and by the way, to achieve that, you know, it took a you know, basically a presidential decree, a huge mandate from D.C., and really totally rearranging the global food markets. We doubled the price of corn, doubled the price of wheat, had rioting in the streets of Mexico over tortilla prices. You know, uh, as George Soros once said, um, he basically said people are not blocks of wood, that there's a reflexivity to markets. And as one thing changes, it affects other things, and people will change their behavior uh, to react to the change in the markets around them. And so... We saw a change in the price of uh, food products, a change in the price of land, uh, dramatic uh, change in, among the uh, agricultural companies. And um, the other issue is infrastructure. I think we've uh, touched on this morning the importance of having an infrastructure network that will deliver these alternate forms of power, whether it's wind or solar or whatever it is, uh, on a, you know, a cheap and reliable basis. Because in, in energy, cheap and reliable are pretty important. And if you look what happened with ethanol, just as a precedent, uh, one of the many problems that's caused a vast number, if not the majority of the ethanol producers to go bankrupt, uh, well, certainly it was the price of oil dropping 80%, but also ethanol can't be transported in the normal oil pipeline network. Uh, ethanol, is a, it attracts water, and so it has to go in its own tanks. There are no ethanol pipelines to deliver ethanol. And so a whole bunch of people put up a whole bunch of ethanol plants sort of, you know, in the cornfields and really hadn't considered carefully about how's it going to get to market. So, and I bring all this up not to uh, crap on ethanol, but just to put it in context, 10 billion gallons of ethanol last year, I think calculates to roughly 650,000 barrels per day. We consume 84 million barrels of oil every day. So ethanol is less than 1% of the consumption of oil. And uh, we sure had to break a lot of eggs to get there. So I, I think the alternate energy stuff is very important, but we have to keep in context what's going on in the broader energy markets. And that 84 million barrels a day is down probably 1.5 million barrels from last year because of the impact of the recession. And, you know, the impact of the change in prices is dramatic. And if you look back at the early 80s, late 70s, we had a pretty similar circumstance where the price of oil had gone up dramatically because of Arab oil embargoes. Uh, 
Uh, price of oil actually quadrupled in price, which is very similar to what happened now. Uh, inflation adjusted actually pretty similar. And there was huge impetus uh, here in the United States and other places around the world to promote conservation. Uh, I think Chrysler came out with the K car. Um, there was a lot of talk about uh, alternate energy supply. And then the price of oil dropped from $40 to $10. Um, and after a couple of years where consumption went down, we sort of creep back up to where we are now, which is, uh, you know, the mileage per gallon um, of the fleet in the, in the U.S. really didn't change much. A lot of the alternate energy things turned out to be a bust. And, and I'm not sort of trying to scare people about what's going on now, but I'm just saying, you know, uh, people do react to the market environment. And when the price of oil drops dramatically, as it has this past year, uh, people react. So I believe that the sales of Toyota Priuses are down roughly 50% year over year. Uh, I, I'm not saying that we're not going to see continued move towards um, conservation and alternate energy supply, but it is in a broader context. And um, just to give you a sense of how big that broader context is, 84 million barrels a day is roughly 30 billion barrels of oil a year. And the run-up in price that happened over the last couple of years, say $100 a barrel times 30 billion barrels a year, is $3 trillion. Now, uh, when people talk about what's caused the current uh, economic crisis, a lot of people focus on sort of the debt crisis and the structured uh, you know, debt products. But people don't talk, I think, enough about $3 trillion tax on the economy of the increase in the price of oil. And, you know, I think that all the stimulus programs that have been announced to date added up together are still less than $3 trillion. And those stimulus programs are going to be spent over many, many years, whereas this $3 trillion was felt in one year. So I, I just think it is important to consider uh, the broader framework, whether it's alternate energy or conventional energy. Um, these are big numbers. And, and one other point I'd make is, you know, I've heard a lot of rhetoric out of – I'm sort of showing my politics now. I've heard a lot of rhetoric out of D.C. about – Let's tax these big major oil companies, and we'll tax them here in America. Well, the big major oil companies don't produce their oil out of America. They produce most of their reserves in foreign countries. And these rich com com companies that they plan on taxing, Exxon had record profits last year, $40 billion. And Rexon, Exxon did accumulate at the end of uh, 2007 one of the largest cash hoards in the world. They're one of the very few companies still rated AAA. They had over $40 billion of cash. Exxon has now liquidated over a third of their cash trying to support their current operations. Exxon is not a cash flow positive business at current oil prices. They are vastly, vastly cash flow negative. They are borrowing money or liquidating their cash investments to pay their dividends. They can't support the capital spending level that they're currently at. In fact, none of the major oil companies can support the capital spending level that they're currently at at current oil prices. Um, and so uh, Chevron, for example, went into debt in the last quarter, um, and they basically had to borrow to fund a large portion of their dividend payments. And why this is important and why I think it comes back to alternate energy and other sources of supply is because if you look, um, there really has been no growth in net supply of oil in any of the countries outside of OPEC um, in many, many years. The one exception being Russia, which after it opened to free markets in the early 90s, was able to reestablish production at levels that previously had achieved, but now Russia is seeing pretty dramatic year-over-year -year declines in their production based on what's going on because of lack of investment currently. And so, um, you know, I think the greatest new source of supply for oil in the world, um, certainly as it relates to America, were the oil sands in Canada. Uh, America imports the largest portion of its oil, not from Saudi Arabia or any country in the Middle East, but from Canada. And the Canadian oil sands are now in complete disarray. Investment there has been canceled or suspended and pushed off. And these are many, many years to bring to market these programs. And as a result of the collapse in oil prices, many of these programs are being canceled. And as I point out with the major oil companies, they simply can't support spending at their current levels with these current prices. And so I hope that the push into alternatives will grow, you know, fivefold, tenfold, you know, twentyfold from where they are today. But they better because our current supply, which is 99% of the supply, isn't growing, and at the current pricing level, we're becoming ever more dependent upon OPEC. <coughs> Frank, uh, could you maybe, we talked a little bit about natural gas and the, the shale place, but I'm very interested, as, as I look at the statistics uh, from EIA, uh, there's a very big increase that they see in renewables for transportation. 
uh, basically going from nothing to 66 billion in 2030. So 66 billion is not a lot, but it's a 38 percent compound between now and 2030. What's going to make that up? And uh, just to lead the witness, what do you think of uh, gas gas uh, for cars? Well, look, as I said earlier, and a bit of a commercial here because we have made several investments in natural gas companies over the last 20 years. Um, natural gas, I think one of the big changes in the last few years, and it's only been recently, like I said, with the emergence of the shales, um, it comes back to the two points I made earlier, which is cheap and reliable. And one of the issues that natural gas had over, the, say, the last 20 years is it was often cheap, but it wasn't perceived as being reliable. Um, we mentioned earlier that still the majority of the power in this country is produced from coal. Why is it produced from coal? Because you can literally pile the coal up at the front of the power plant, and people know that we have many, many years of domestic supply, and you just got to dig it out of the ground. And so utility executives like security of supply. They like cheap and reliable. And natural gas has gone through some, some interesting dynamics really since the 1980s. We were talking about this earlier this morning. You know, we went through a big deregulation of the pipeline industry in the late 80s. And then in the 90s, there was the emergence of sort of freely traded markets in natural gas, the emergence of the future markets. Um, I would say sort of the um, disproportionate activity by companies like Enron and some of the other merchant trading companies. Um, that, uh, you know, there was a big move towards gas-fired power generation uh, throughout the 90s, and I would say that most of the new generation capacity added for many years was gas-powered, mm, and that's why the price of electricity is priced off the price of gas, because gas was the marginal source. But the issue has always been, is this reliable? Is it dependable? When you have a commodity that goes from $4 to $14 back to $3, you know, natural gas and electricity are the two most volatile commodities on Earth. And so you've got this inherent disconnect between very volatile short-term product pricing and very long-term required capital investment to bring resources to market. And I think the importance of these shale resources, uh, apart from being domestic, is that, and, and apart from being clean, gas is much cleaner to burn than coal. It uh, generates, I believe, half the CO2 uh, per unit of energy consumed um, and much less other toxic gases. Uh, is this you know, domestic and reliable? There is an infrastructure for gas. Uh, gas, I think, should be taking share away from uh, older, dirtier sources of power like coal. And there's a push by people, including Boone Pickens, to have gas be a meaningful portion of the transportation fuel in North America. So, for example, city bus fleets could be uh, LNG and natural gas um, uh, powered. And I think it's a good idea. And I think, you know, first the producers have to prove to the industry, and I think they need to get the word out, that there is a long-term reliable, cheap, domestic power source in natural gas. Thanks. And then I'd be remiss not to mention that Frank has made a ton of money in the MLP sector, and the MLP sector is uh, to natural gas what transmission is to power. So could you talk about MLPs, some of your experience, and then how important is that uh, for the uh, bringing out of gas from the shale place? Yeah, well, you know, part of the issue is that where some of these shales are being um, developed. I mean, shale, pe people have known that gas was in the shale for going back 70 years when the oil fields were developed in the 30s. And what they do is they drill through it and they go, oh, there's shale. Okay, we don't want that. Let's keep going and find some sandstone. So they, they know where it is. The good news about gas and shale is there's no expiration. It's 100% success. Uh, but the issue is getting it out cheaply, which means horizontal drilling and uh, new uh, fracturing technologies, massive hydraulic multi-stage fracturing, but also having the network uh, that where you find it may not be where the pipelines got built. Unlike oil, which you can put in a knapsack or a, you know, a Tupperware bowl, uh, gas is a gas. And so it really has to go in a pipeline to get to market. And a lot of our pipeline infrastructure in the United States is geared towards uh, driving the gas from basically the Gulf of Mexico region, uh, where Henry Hub, Louisiana is, where they price uh, the marginal price of gas. And those resources have declined over the years because they were drilled out years and years ago. And many of these new emerging resources are coming from areas in the Rocky Mountains, uh, from East Texas, uh, from up in Appalachia. And the development of pipelines that can secure long-term contracts to gather the gas and process the gas and get it to market, I think is a very attractive business. Now, you know, the bad news for the gas producers is uh, we've got some very weak gas prices, and they may be weak for some time because there's a pretty strong um, – excess of supply over demand and, and, and an excess of gas in storage inventories right now. The good news for the MLPs or pipeline companies is somebody has to gather that gas and get it to market. And uh, 
I think uh, that will remain a very good business. And, and, you know, a few years ago, guys like us trying to make private equity investments were kind of priced out of that business because of the publicly traded MLPs that had access to cheap capital. But as the public markets have corrected, uh, that relative disadvantage has changed. Thanks. Last question from me. Who, who are the major players that, are, uh, that have the leases in the important shale plays, and um, what do you think their posture will be in the next couple of years relative to the, uh, the low gas price? You know, there's some big companies like um, Devon and, and Canna Energy, which are independent uh, producers that have large shale plays. A company called Chesapeake Energy, I think, has one of the largest uh, uh, land holdings in the area. Uh, there's a company called Exco Resources, which is uh, relatively smaller, but bang for the buck, has very big holdings in both the Marcellus Shale and the Haynesville Shale. But the issue these companies have is they had to go and sort of pay through the nose to buy the land in the run-up in commodity prices, and now they're holding really much more land than they can um, drill up and fund with their existing operating cash flow. And typically, they've got constraints with debt on their balance sheets that, you know, as the price of the commodity comes down, the banks lower the borrowing base of their assets, and they can't get access to incremental debt capital very easily and they're not too eager to dilute their shareholders by doing highly dilutive equity offerings. And so one emerging phenomenon you see is you've got these very large uh, major companies, major oil companies that are trying to spend $25, $30 billion a year that really kind of, I don't want to say miss the boat, but just aren't <coughs> focused on domestic, um, developing up domestic assets. They've got the cash, and uh, they can't fund capital spending at the current level, but they can still fund a lot of capital spending. And these other smaller independent companies have the resources, have the assets that are, need the capital. And so you're seeing an emergence of uh, joint venture opportunities coming about where some of these big companies, including foreign oil producers, um, uh, not so much national oil companies, but companies like Statoil and British Petroleum, are cutting joint ventures with companies like Chesapeake um, to uh, develop those resources. And I think that's an interesting trend. We're going to see more of it. And some of the other companies I mentioned that haven't announced them, I would expect them to be looking to do them. Frank, uh, just one thing um, on the, the ethanol numbers, you said it, because I think this, you know, I, I've known Frank for 25 years. He's always got a bead right on the issue. The intersection between the real markets and these alternative smaller markets on the margin is very interesting. So what do you think, kind of putting yourself back in time, if you'd taken that ethanol supply off the market, when oil was at 140. Can you talk a little bit about about the impact of the alternatives on that razor's edge margin in high demand times? Yeah, Phil makes a great point, which is even though it's a relatively small portion of the supply, it does matter on the margin. And clearly what's driven the price of oil, uh, at least in my opinion, uh, down from a peak of $140 uh, a barrel uh, to a low of sort of uh, $40 a barrel, has been uh, partially the impact of these incremental uh, sources of supply, whether it's ethanol or other, or, or conservation measures. And so, you know, I believe that petroleum-based uh, transportation motor gasoline demand in the United States is down roughly 7% year over year. And a big portion of that is because of displacement from ethanol. So I'm not saying it's not important on the margin, because it is very important on the margin. What I'm saying is we've got a long-term problem that we better make sure we have long-term solutions and displacing a significant portion of it with a, you know, an industry that springs up and then sort of falls back just in the span of a couple of years because they're not isolated. You know, when the price of oil falls, that hurts the ethanol producers, particularly when the price of oil falls and the price of corn goes up. So, um, you know, the bad news, good news about the oil market is it's well established. Uh, we, um, but, but Frank, hold on there yeah. for one sec. I mean, in some sense, take the word ethanol off the page. Take bodies off the page. These are really just transportation fuel refineries. And I think if you said three years ago to an investment bank, what's the correlation between corn prices and gasoline? They would have said, you're an idiot. There's no correlation there. <laughs> and now those markets are absolutely correlated. So can't you take your dinosaur-like experience set here and say <laughs> an ethanol plant is really just an expensive refinery? So it's a refinery that's non-viable, maybe like... Uh, the oil sands, at $50 oil, that refinery is useless to me, 
at 150, it's vastly fascinating to me. Isn't that the, really the right way to look at it? I think it's an important way to look at it. And I think when we look at some of the you know, alter, uh, merchant-generated power plants, yeah. it's the same thing. They're converting natural gas or whatever the product input is to power, and they're making money on the spread. And we talk about, uh, for example, the MLP space, the gas transportation. A lot of the money those guys make is in processing natural gas, stripping the liquids out of the gas, and they're basically trading between the difference of gas prices and petroleum product prices. And so that is very important. It ties back to the comment I made about Soros, that these markets are highly <coughs> dynamic. I think one of the issues that ethanol faces, um, and I'm not an ethanol expert, but just from reading about it, is just energy intensity, that it takes a fair amount of energy to generate ethanol. And so the input prices are corn, but also the power ethanol price. Ethanol plants, I believe, burn natural gas largely to uh, generate the ethanol. Absolutely. They burn, they burn natural gas. They have less power density. All those things are true. All I'm trying to say is if you take the next step in your analysis, which is basically I don't really care whether it comes from the wind or whether it comes from the sun or whether it comes from corn, just tell me the price per MMBTU or tell me the price of liquid fuel. I agree with that. And all I'm saying to you is once you do that, there actually are some interesting repercussions. Yes, there's going to be a cyclicality, and you're going to get killed in some of these markets and downturns. But the converse is true as well, which if in the long term you're worried about energy supply, if in the long term you think energy demand is going to go up, when you look at a distressed or bankrupt ethanol company, you might say, geez, that's a really nice long-dated option on a refinery that works at a certain prices. And I'm not pushing ethanol. You could say that. No, no, I, I, I totally agree with you. And so that, I think, really is the, the smart way to think about In fact, energy. I think we saw just recently in the last week or two, I believe it was Valero, which is one of the largest uh, refining companies, uh, has gotten now into ethanol, trying to sort of, you know, sometimes it's the second mouse that gets the cheese. We can open up to questions if you have them. Please go ahead. I'm just curious why none of you have mentioned geothermal, where there are some uh, huge tax incentives also. Um, I'll talk about geothermal just for a second because um, I, although I've made investments in 30 different oil and gas companies, I'm actually, I've just installed a geothermal heating system in my own home. Uh, but it did cost me five times as much as a conventional system. And so I think my break even is in, uh, unfortunately about forever. <laughs> <laughs> there are attractive geothermal sites. From our perspective, it's not nearly as large scale an opportunity as wind. So if you look uh, out in the west, there are a number of geothermal development plays that are going on right now. And if it's good resource, then they can be economic. They can approach the cost of wind. But uh, it's not as large scale of a place, so it's not going to be as big of a component of uh, the supply mix. And the other thing is it's really kind of a hybrid between E&P and power because one of the biggest risks in those projects is uh, the, the geologic risk, which uh, is something that uh, power guys typically are not all that versed in. I'm a little bit more bullish on geothermal, but I think the last part of that question is exactly right. When we've looked at geothermal plays, we've said, you know, we don't want kind of exploration risk. We want to get uh, private equity returns versus project. And it's really stunning how many of them are greenfield plays. So very few companies come in and say, we've got existing geothermal and we're going to buy a producing asset. They almost all say that the, the economics still favor make versus buy, and I think it does fall between not safe enough for the project finance funds, doesn't really fit an oil and gas fund, and not enough return for kind of venture funds. So I actually think long-term, the other problem is location. Some of the best geothermal sites are not where the big population centers are. But I think bullish long-term, it is a kind of tweener when it comes to some of the capital sources, I think, in the United States. And I think what Phil said earlier about, you know, sort of at the end of the day, you've got to look at all these things as sort of trade-offs in terms of uh, incremental supply. And that depends on the marginal pricing of the alternate commodities. So I think geothermal probably is a lot more interesting in a 100 to $140 oil price environment than in a 40 to $60 oil price environment. But one thing about geothermal that's positive, it's a very reliable source of power. You look at uh, wind, wind is uh, notoriously unreliable. It's uh, very difficult to predict uh, what the wind is going to be blowing the next hour, much less the day ahead. And it tends to blow more at night when you don't need it as much uh, versus during the day. And solar has got a better profile to it, but solar is also unpredictable. You don't know 
when it's going to be sunny versus uh, cloud cover. So, but geothermal is a very reliable resource once it's up and running. John? Uh, you really, none of you went into nuclear. If you comment, perhaps, uh, Bill, on, on the stat political prospects and the prospects of the smart answer to our energy problems, a lot of the smart answer is nuclear power. But the the very depressing story of nuclear power is unfortunately one that I have a little bit of first-hand experience in. I, in 1982, uh, when I was in high school, I interned on the Senate Energy Committee, and they were going to decide that year nuclear waste policy. So what we're going to do with nuclear waste, um, I guess we're up to 27 years later, uh, we haven't done anything. So it's not that we've made a mistake. We're still deciding what to do. That is not such a great track record. And uh, I, the Yucca Mountain, I don't know if Yucca Mountain's the right idea or the bad idea, but it's unbelievable how inept we are in nuclear policy, and I don't see that changing. So it's absolutely the right answer. I think the system is completely incapable of uh, doing it. If you look at France, what French can't do anything, I mean, really, you know, except make good ties and food and wine. But their <laughs> nuclear policy is that's actually three, three things better than Canada, actually, France. <laughs> uh, uh, but they've got nuclear power, right? And so it really is embarrassing, I think, from a domestic level, how inept we are at it. I would actually say, in defense of my home country, I think Canada's also got a very progressive nuclear policy stance, and their can-do reactors have been well-received, and uh, I agree with Phil. It, it's a political issue more so than an economic issue. What do you think the, the nuclear sorry nuclear percentage is for Canada, Frank, just to put it in perspective, versus our 19? You know, I'll defer to John. Maybe he knows more than I do, but it's, 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 it's pretty Frank significant. Frank always answers without the data. I like that. Yeah. Canada John, has uh, a that. much higher portion of hydroelectric and nuclear power. In fact, uh, you know, the, the main uh, power you, you, monopoly in Ontario for years was called uh, Ontario Hydro. We, we, we didn't, sure. Canadians don't talk about power. They talk about hydro. Mm -hmm. uh, I would think it's a little bit higher than the United States, maybe in the 30% range, but uh, it, it's certainly not uh, 50%. Okay. Peter? Uh, a number of the, of the alternative areas you discussed today had, had sounded good until we got to relative pricing and then all of a sudden these things fall out of bed. Does, it argues, I suspect, for maybe some form of government policy that has to do with setting base pricing of some sort. Uh, Obama has said that's a non-starter, but what are your views on um, some kind of base pricing to uh, support development of alternatives. So, so ba I'm sorry, base pricing of, of, uh, of oil, for instance. So tax, fuel tax or whatever that guarantees uh, consumer pricing, consumer costs for fuel somewhere north of some dollar amount, uh, 350 a gallon or whatever. I personally think that it's going to be more in the form of uh, renewable energy standards and things of that nature where you uh, force the demand for the product, and I, I think that is, it's a hidden tax because uh, that then ends up driving up, uh, in my example, the cost of electricity, but I think that's a lot more palatable tax than to put a tax on fuel. Uh, but I think your, the, your premise, your question is dead on right. It goes to Frank's point, right? If, you, if the government said, look, we're not going to let uh, oil go below $60 a barrel, and so if it goes to 40 we're going to impose a tax of 20 use that tax for 20 to funnel into my companies and my funds so I can do alternative stuff. Um, you know, there's a certain logic to that, particularly from where I sit. Um, <laughs> but uh, the problem is the government just won't impose a carbon tax or even think about those floors because, once again, they just are so deathly afraid of anything that explicitly raises prices. And that's why setting a renewable standard, giving a tax credit for wind – mandating Absolutely. ethanol, all those things work, even though if you really spend some time thinking about it, I think you probably end up where you are, or nuclear power, or geothermal. It's just tough problems. As I, I hate to be repetitive, but I do think data bears me out on this point, that they don't like that type of question. Bob? Well. Like if you have an abundant resource, you should try to optimize that. 
Well, I, I think that clean coal technology is more towards the uh, energy technology part, so I'll defer to Phil. But uh, my understanding is it, it's, you know, the pilot program they were putting forward was literally billions of dollars. And given the current administration's focus on coal, it just doesn't seem to be getting a lot of support right now. And the economics aren't looking particularly attractive from where we sit. So rather than trying to clean up the coal, uh, you know, I've been sort of one-sided here, but I think it's a lot easier to go press for some of the other domestic production we have, for example, clean natural gas. But uh, I also think it's important to promote domestic production of oil. So, you know, we have domestic oil resources in this country. We have a lot of it, um, and it is long-lived and stable. Um, and uh, it's not much of a poster child for the industry, but that movie with uh, Daniel Day-Lewis, There Will Be Blood, that came out. Um, we actually own those wells. Those, those are real wells that were drilled 100 years ago. We own them. They're in California. They're still producing today. Um, and, you know, the fields that those come from, uh, that company has increased its production almost 100% since the beginning of 2008, notwithstanding currently low oil prices. So it is possible to produce energy domestically in this country, but I think, uh, uh, back to the earlier statement, you need to have a coherent energy strategy and sort of uh, promoting one thing and then changing it, another thing, then changing it. It sort of it, it, it just feels a little bit like what happened back in the early 80s, which you know uh, didn't really end up having significant long-term impact in terms of shifting sources of supply. But, but Frank, I think if you took the BTU arbitrage between coal companies and natural gas companies, for example, there's a holy grail out there. I mean, I, I actually happen to think that it will be a very large fund, not an energy technology guy, that makes the breakthrough on coal gasification or clean coal, however you want to say it, because it's right there, the money to be made. No government issue, no uh, support. The market says to you, the solution to this problem has the following value, and it's a big number. I mean, I forget what Peabody Trades had compared to, you know, any of your uh, natural gas plays, but it is there for the person that cracks that arbitrage to make a lot of money. So when we look at clean coal or coal gasification, we looked at it and said, can this math work just based on taking something that has a, a dirty uh, footprint and making it clean? And it's actually a very interesting uh, math exercise. So I want to hold out the idea that you'll see over the next few years, you know, some large uh, – oil and gas or private equity fund put a substantial amount of money into it at the same time they make a play in a coal resource to try and capture that arbitrage. Yeah, I, I, don't, disagree. I don't disagree with that. I think it is going to be part of the resource mix given how much coal we have, but it's not economic right now. If you take a look at uh, clean coal, the cost of sequestration, uh, the facilities uh, are quite a bit more expensive than natural gas, particularly where natural gas is uh, gotten right now. So they are going to re rely on some form of support, and that's increased by, if you look at the development costs associated with a clean coal facility, it is not cookie cutter like a combined cycle gas plant. Tremendous amount of engineering, tremendous amount of upfront costs associated with uh, the design of that, and as a result, a lot of risk. I think one of the issues is the current administration has uh, chosen to uh, prioritize renewables versus clean coal, and in the short term, in the current markets, without some form of uh, support, I think it's going to be a while before we see clean coal projects. Steve has a question. But what about battery technology? I mean, a lot of these alternatives are more viable if you have good battery technology. Of course, that's not very good for Mr. Pato's, uh CNG vehicles if you have good batteries because um, you then can take electricity and make it into a transportation solution. So. Uh, that would be the electricity that's over 50% generated by coal. <laughs> Fair enough. I talked about the vehicles, not the plants. Um, Frank, that's your picture up there. Don't forget. Um, uh, you know, I think nuclear power is smart. Is you got to have uh, you got to have real time pricing with electricity, and if you got to have a great battery storage play, it would be fantastic. What's the state of the uh, technology? Uh, uh, Nascent. I mean, you, every, here's, here's the typical battery thing we see. Uh, we're the best battery technology in the world. We're cheaper. We're better. We have better storage. We have better power. Um, we have $15 million in revenues because we uh, power hand tools 
very good for hand tools. You're like, well, that doesn't sound so exciting to me. No, 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 Phil, we're going to do this, this, this. But right now, we're in this one little niche market, and our pre-money is $300 million. I'd say there are about 50 companies that that fits. So you've got big incumbent players, some of whose batteries catch on fire on computers, some of which are pretty good. Then you've got little guys that are too expensive. There are hundreds of them. So it's, it's a little scary, but it is a, a smart area to think about, hard to execute on well. Another area of uh, battery technology that doesn't get as much press is as part of the transmission grid. Because if you start to look at uh, very constrained areas where it's very difficult to de-bottleneck through a traditional transmission solution, maybe not enough uh, land or an ability to permit uh, a new power plant to serve that load pocket, there are some battery solutions where you can put in place a battery bank that then can uh, de-bottleneck and provide reliability for the grid. I heard, um, so as you said, I mean, I had this philosophy that hard decisions don't get made well in D.C. And I was at a talk in which someone said, how about for cap and trade, what we do is we put in the cap and trade, we sell the permits now, we take that money, put it into alternative energy, but we don't really put the system in place for another 10 years. So I thought to myself, well, that's just a tax, really, to go to alternative energy. You don't have to make any hard decisions until at least a president or two from now. I said, that sounds like a pretty viable solution set in Washington talk. So I think they're going to say, yeah, Europe's a disaster. There are problems. I don't really feel like getting into a fight as to whether utilities should have it. So I don't know what the final thing looks like, but I suspect it's very watered down because people are aware of the problems in Europe. And also, there's a real question on cap and trade as to who gets the credits. And there's, I mean, it's all over today's journal, the New York Times. So, yes, I, I don't think anyone's going to spend a lot of time trying to get the ideal solution, but they will take action, and those may be different things. Boris, you had a question? Well, my question was, uh, the IMF projects that in 2050 there will be 3 billion cars in the world from about 600 million a uh, few years ago. And I just wanted to see, maybe, maybe Phil, if you have a, a vision of how that, um, how that is possible, because of course, what strain does that put on the energy, uh, the, the energy uh, system that we have? And the, if that, uh, in IMF's estimation, would raise the temperature, if, if we use car, and, uh, car technology, by 3% uh, in, in the world. So it c could be partly batteries, but other, other ways to get the, the footprint down so that we can get to that number. Uh, it, it, it's... You know, the vision thing's hard, right? Because with the mega cities, you know, one of the great things about New York City is how energy efficient it is, right? Because no one really drives within New York City. And, and so I sometimes have a hard time when I, when I see numbers like that, understanding if I really am intellectually capable to go that far out and figure out what the world looks like. Um, so the short answer is, I don't know how it all plays out. And I think Frank's quotation of Soros is right. I just don't know what the unintended consequences and the behavioral changes are. I would say, as John's talked about, the grid is a, a funny problem, a transporting power, storing power. And when you think about using the car to get involved in that, I think that's actually quite interesting. I mean, we, we have an investment in a hybrid bus company, and Mayor Bloomberg is very into making trash trucks hybrid, in part so you don't hear the noise in the morning, but also in part because a hybrid vehicle has a generator on it. And he could then use those trash trucks as backup power in the event of a crisis. He could have mobile generators. And so That's I think, so when you start thinking of a car as a way to store energy, it's got liquid storage in it, and it cre that to me, I think it's something like that. When you start saying there are that many cars, and you start saying we've got grid constraints and politicians are bad at that,
I think there's something there with using your car to store energy, sell back to the grid, pull it off, level load. Uh, that makes some sense. I'm sorry that's a bad answer, but it's about as good as I can do. Just talking about electric cars, uh, it's a great idea at a 10,000 foot level. You start to go a little bit closer to the surface and there's a lot of complexity. Part of it is uh, how's the electricity being produced because it's not necessarily environmentally friendly if the electricity is being produced by coal. So one of the things that is good about it is you can charge your car overnight and to the extent you've got a lot of nuclear power in a particular country then that can be something that's good for the environment but uh, I think it's really going to be case specific and it's going to be a function of the uh, underlying electricity generation that's going to drive the environmental side of that. It does solve your wind problem, though, right? Because you can use that wind power from night, yeah. and if you have your car charging over eight hours, you wouldn't necessarily care yeah. about dips. You level out the, yeah. uh, the peak off peak. Load right, that's period. right. So there's some neat yeah. partial I, I, I think one sort of important issue that you raised with your question is, you know, whose problems are we trying to solve? And, and where are these problems coming from? And where are the solutions going to come from? Because, you, you know, in terms of oil demand, uh, that's not us. That's not the United States. That's not actually any of the OECD countries. Demand in the OECD countries has barely risen, in fact, maybe even down uh, since the year 2000 for basically most of the last decade. So really all the world's demand is coming from the developing nations. And yet we're imposing some pretty big hidden taxes on our economy here in this country to solve those problems. And it is important to address the issue of dependence on foreign oil. But global warming is a global phenomenon. And, uh, you know, the biggest incremental contributor to global warming is not coming from this country either. So I don't mean to say it's somebody else's problem, not our problem, but the question is, what's the resolve of the, you know, uh, of the constituency in this country to fund the solution to the world's biggest free rider problem, really? And uh, just to use the example of my home country, Canada, there was a study done about 18 months ago where Canadians said that global warming was by far the most important problem in Canada. Now, that was in an environment where oil is like 100 bucks a barrel, and Canada's economy is roughly 50% resource extraction-based. Fast forward to today, where the economy is in serious recession, the oil sands have collapsed, the employment growth has just reversed, housing prices have tumbled. Uh, when they ask people, global warming is not the number one issue anymore. So uh, it's an important phenomenon to play out, and it's going to play out over many, many years. These are problems that take, you know, 50, 100 years, and I think you still don't solve them. But it's important to factor in, you know, there's clearly a big focus right now in the current administration to fix global warming and, you know, carbon issues. But we also have trillion-dollar deficits, and eventually we're going to have, you know, Social Security running out of money and all these other issues to deal with. So it's hard to predict out many years what will be the biggest issues and how people will react. I think we're getting close to time. Any last thoughts from our panelists? Okay, with that, I'd say thank you very much. I thought that was really meaty and interesting.